Well, it's not Scream without Sidney Prescott, that's for sure. And we definitely wanted to approach it that way. And and having Nev be a part of it was integral to our, our participation in it as well. Well, that's really nice. <laughs> Much to discuss in today's review, obviously. First, I'm gonna go over as much of the behind the scenes of the making of this movie as I can. I'll share as many spoiler-free fun facts about production that I can before I get into my spoiler-free thoughts on the movie. This is kind of dodgy territory because I feel like you should go into a Scream movie as blind as you possibly can. That being said, I think that I'm someone you can trust to have an honestly spoiler-free section in her video. A lot of my subs have been asking where this review has been because over the course of the past few weeks, I've been doing a Scream for Dummies series on the entire franchise. And also Scream 6 has been out for about two weeks now. I just prefer to wait because then that way I know that all the Scream super fans have seen the movie so then I can freely kind of talk about spoilers in the latter half of my video. Not everyone can get out weekend one, so hopefully by now we're all gravy. Then I will make it explicitly known when I'm starting my spoiler section. I'll get into the juicier behind the scenes tidbits about the movie and then I'll also give all my thoughts on the biggest plot points of the movie. See, don't you realize I have your best interest at home? heart. Don't you trust me? So I, as your would-be charismatic leader, think that you should definitely join this community. And it's as easy as clicking subscribe. You should also click the like and the notification bell, that way you never miss our next meeting. But I'm glad that's all out of the way because there is much to get into with Scream 6. Don't worry, I will circle back to the opening of this video because I'm sure that you're itching to know more details about Nev's non-return. But I want to go in chronological order of all the events. All the interviews that I watched were of Courtney Cox, the core four that came back from from Scream 5, Hayden Panettiere, Dermot Mulroney, and the Radio Silence guys. So this is all straight from the source, baby. Let's start at the beginning, shall we? So to catch you back up, just a little refresher, Scream 5 came out in January of last year and it made $140 million internationally, far surpassing Scream 4 and honestly catching a lot of people by surprise. Fans of the franchise loved this movie. These new filmmakers were welcomed with open arms and so pretty much immediately a sequel was greenlit. You probably got a text on premiere night. No, I mean, honestly, it was that, I think before that, yeah, right? it, was, yeah. it was super cra crazy fast. Guy Busick and James Vanderbilt, the screenwriters of Scream 5 and Scream 6, started to work on Scream 6 right when they got that news. The directors are not really involved in the writing process, though. As it turns out, uh, Busick and Vanderbilt kind of like to sequester themselves when they do their first draft. But they all have a group text and a group document where they can constantly float ideas whenever they need a quick fix during production. This was a necessary outlet, especially once they learned that Nev Campbell was not returning for this installment. According to Radio Silence, though, they had very little involvement when it came to whether or not Nev would return. We genuinely love Nev. We had so much fun with her on the last one. She was so great to us. She was so welcoming. She was so kind. She was so helpful. She, like, she taught us what to do in a lot of this stuff. We had an open line of communication and we would talk on the phone and we Zoomed a couple times about it. This is a business decision and we were like, we respect it. And she was couldn't have been better, couldn't have been nicer about it. We had a lot of private conversations with Nev and we're like huge fans of hers and we're huge fans of Sydney. We absolutely support her choice to not do this. You know, I mean, it was like, I know it wasn't easy for her. It's something she's been a part of her life for 25 years. And we didn't want to in any way disrespect that while we were in pre-production. We were like, you know, whatever's going to work best for you, you let us know. We'll keep this communication open. As you can see, the story remains consistent in multiple interviews. They're really not involved with the business end of production. If you saw my last video, Scream for Dummies Part 5, you know how much it meant to them to work with Nev Campbell. They wrote her a really heartfelt letter, they were super adamant about respecting Wes's legacy, and she loved working with them. But as far as the business and the legality of production, they were pretty much powerless. You can tell that this is the case as well when they go on to talk about using different horror icon masks in this film. In a subway scene, there are all kinds of icon masks like Michael Myers, Pinhead, etc., and their legal team was like, you cannot do this. Then several weeks later, I don't know, I guess they cut through a bunch of red tape, and they were like, just kidding, and the directors were like, oh sweet. They're very much at the mercy of the studio with a lot of things. At the end of the day, Nev not coming back was a business decision for her and it was not anything personal. They all still have a good relationship. And it's really sweet. There's this People interview where the younger cast is talking about how they missed Nev, but this allowed them to get a lot closer with Courtney. We definitely miss her, but I got a really sweet text from her right before we started shooting, which felt like a blessing, kind of. Mm. It's also so wonderful that Nev took it upon herself to reach out to Melissa because Melissa went through hell after the release of Scream 5. We're gonna get into this a bit more during 
during the spoiler section, but this is not a spoiler by any means. After the release of Scream 5, Melissa Barrera was at the mercy of so much hate from Scream fans. Ironic because the whole point of Scream 5 is to call out toxic fandom, but that's a meta element that's explored with Sam's character in Scream 6. A lot of the really shitty, negative, just bullshit that she was dealing with, you know, after the release of the last one. We always knew that there was so much more to do with that character and that and we were hoping people would give her a chance to like actually take the arc to its like to its next logical kind of step mm -hmm. in, in the evolution of who Sam Carpenter is. And we're so fucking proud of Melissa. She owns that role in a way that, I mean, we've seen a lot of people kind of walk back their shittiness, which it feels really good. Like mm -hmm. it, it it feels like there's um there's been some redemption for that character and and it's nice to like see Melissa getting the love that she that she really truly deserves. We will get into so much more of her character development soon because it is one of the highlights of the film. You could probably take a guess that a lot of the hate she got was from a small niche of people that cannot fathom the existence of a Scream movie without Sidney Prescott. Their little pea brains are so resistant to change that they're willing to lash out at whoever that face of change is. The craziest thing is that they equate their dislike of the character to a dislike of Melissa herself. In my last video, I had a lot of complaints about Sam, but it was about the writing. You would never catch catch me lashing out at the actress herself. It's got nothing to do with her. I'm so glad that according to them, it seems like a lot of people have walked back on their negativity. I will today as well. But my beef has always been with the writing, like I said, with Jenna and Melissa's characters, never with the girls themselves. So more on that later. Let's talk about some happier casting choices, lighten the mood a little bit. Samara Weaving stars in Scream 6, and this is something that they wanted ever since they learned they were directing this film. We just wanted to make another movie with Samara. It was like anything, please be in a movie with that we're making. The minute that we had all agreed, oh, she could be Laura, we're like, yes, let's call her right now. And it it took all of a walk to dinner to call, let her manager know, call her. She said, yep, don't care what I'm doing. I'll be on a plane, just tell me when. <laughs> this was also the closest that Samara Weaving has ever felt to playing herself in a film, which I think is really fun. She even gets to use her natural Australian accent, which I've never seen before. I love to see her getting paid her due because I've been a staunch supporter of her since like 2016 or whenever the babysitter came out. Out. Then she was in Mayhem, and then a few years later, Ready or Not, I was like, you guys, this is a Scream Queen in the making. Now the whole world knows, and life is so good. And oh my god, speaking of Ready or Not, they just casually dropped in an interview that they're working on a sequel to Ready or Not with Samara Weaving. I don't know how you can make a sequel to that film, but I don't care. Like, uh huh? So good. You know what else is so good? The return of Kirby. You thought I wasn't gonna talk about that, you goober? Hayden Panettiere is the light of my life, truly, and you wanna know why? She called them up to get Kirby to return. She was like, you guys, I think I might still be alive. She called them, I think during the pre-production of Scream 5, but it was just a little bit late to get cast. What has it been like for you to kind of see fans campaigning and hoping for your survival and see like Amazing. the Kirby hive rise. <laughs> Amazing, so inspirational, so, yeah. uh, so I, I needed it so badly. They came to my rescue, honestly. For them, I, I went knocking and I was like, please bring me back. And what do we love? To see it. I love that they did right by this character and they didn't force a cameo in part five because that was the original plan. They settled for that little interview Easter egg and then she lent her voice for the two West scene. They basically all crossed their fingers for the success of Scream 5 so that they could bring her back for Scream 6. That's one thing I definitely respect about these writers because they put their all into each movie. They purposefully don't save ideas for the next film. If they have a good idea, they use it. Unless it's the case of Kirby and they really want to do right by a character. Also, nothing makes my heart more full than when you absolutely adore a character and the actor loves that character just as much. It felt like coming home. I found myself in Kirby in Scream 4. We are very similar. I wanted to bring that back and make sure that the same Kirby survived and is that same lion lioness that she has always been. Hayden is also a horror fan in real life and feels a real kinship to Kirby. And speaking of characters I love, let's get into the rest of the returning cast. One other person was sorely missing, a one Heather Matarazzo. Heather Matarazzo, that's, you know what? Get her kicking Ghostface's ass. Yeah. Put her in a full 
fist fight with Ghostface oh, yeah. in the next one. Roundhouse kicks and all, please. Yep. I hadn't even really thought about her until Mason said he wanted to see her in a fist fight with Ghostface, and then I was like, oh yeah, that would be rad. Heather Matarazzo was also very outspoken about Nev Campbell, saying that she deserved to be paid her worth. I'd like to see her come back in Scream 7, especially because Jasmine and Mason have continually pitched that they cast Dwayne The Rock Johnson as their father. That has the potential to be the funniest thing that I've ever seen. Are you joking? Anyway, speaking of Jasmine and Mason, they were yet again the most entertaining part of my research. I'm sure you've seen this clip already, but I have to share it again because it'll have been a moment on Twitter. I want it to live on forever in this review. In a BuzzFeed interview, the entire cast took a quiz to see which character they would be in the Scream franchise. And the results were astonishing. Three, two, one. Randy Sydney Meeks. Prescott, bro. Final girl. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. Final girl, baby. Last one. Just me and the girls. Final. We don't die. What? Live forever. I'm Can't having die. secondhand embarrassment. All time. <laughs> this is going on the internet forever. <laughs> See you there, Twitter. Mwah. Kisses. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me out. out of that. <laughs> Once again, I stress the importance of viral marketing. I'm obsessed with the fact that Mason and Jasmine are basically Chad and Mindy in real life. They're basically real life siblings to each other. Jasmine is also queer in real life and she was finally able to talk about what the representation in Scream 5 meant to her. Well, it means everything to me because I am just so grateful that they gave me an opportunity to play a character who isn't defined by her queerness, who isn't defined by queer trauma, who gets to have a traumatic experience along with her friends and happens to be queer and it has nothing to do with the fact that she's queer. And that kiss, I'm so grateful to the filmmaking team because that was an idea that I pitched and they said yes. I've had people in my comments tell me that originally Amber and Tara were supposed to be girlfriends. I didn't come upon that anywhere in my research, but this is straight from the source that Jasmine actually pitched that kiss to the filmmakers and they were super receptive. To have that kind of queer representation in one of the biggest horror franchises in history means more than I can really put into words. And speaking of representation, this is a landmark film. It's led by two Latina women and two black people, which is a historical first for a blockbuster film like this. In fact, they were a huge selling point for the audience of Scream 6. Scream 6 had the biggest opening weekend of the entire franchise, making a whopping $67 million internationally. Deadline also conducted a study on who was showing out for this movie, and it's really interesting. 38% of the audience that showed out was Latino and Hispanic, with 24% of the audience reporting that they went to see the movie because it was starring Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera, proving that we all win as Scream fans when the cast is diversified. I do think it is more important to hear from Latin people themselves on the importance of that representation rather than just from me. So I asked a few friends to send in a brief statement on what that representation meant to them. First up, this is a longtime friend and collaborator of this channel, Tiago from Royal Horror. The representation in Scream 6 is just so, so impactful because of two reasons. The Latin representation and the queer representation. Obviously, I'm Latin, I'm from Colombia, so seeing Melissa Barrera leading one of the biggest horror franchises ever, it was just so beautiful to see because sadly, that's not something that happens really often, having a Latin actor or actress leading a huge big film. So having Melissa Barrera doing that in Scream, one of my favorite horror franchises, it was just so beautiful and it hit so different because that leaves so many doors open for upcoming latin actors and actresses and also because she's using her voice and her popularity at the moment to give knowledge about the latin community so that's just beautiful to see and also because her being latina it doesn't surround about her character in the screen movies so that's just beautiful not stereotypes not cliches we love to see it and when it comes to the queer representation obviously i love 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 so much having mindy as the lead in this film and also her relationship with annika because because I'm queer, so having a gay lead in these movies, in a slasher, in horror, without the stereotypes, without cliches, having them kissing, it's just so, so, so beautiful because as the gays, we need this representation uh, without the stereotypes or cliches. And having her as like the horror nerd, it's just everything adds up. And I love to see this because you wanna be seen. And I think I'm s we're so fortunate that Scream 6 is doing this for us. Wonderful, thank you, Tiago. I love that he touches on queer representation too because that meant a lot to me personally as well. And up next, I have the lovely Celise from Sweet and Spooky to share her piece. Hello, my sweeties. Thank you so much to Kylie for having me here on the channel today to talk about what it was like for me to see 
Two Latinas leading Scream. As all of you know, in Scream 2022 and Scream 6, our story revolves around our two leads, Sam and Tara Carpenter, played by Melissa Barrera and Jenna Ortega, respectively. I have to say, it was really nice to see two Latinas leading a Scream film. Oh my god, I was absolutely gagged. Their characterization was refreshing too, as Latinas in horror movies, or just movies in general, are typically portrayed as hypersexual or overly badass. It was really nice to just see Latina people on screen without specifically characterizing them as such. They're very much just regular people who happen to be Latina. I really can't sit here and say I'm not conflicted though. As I mentioned, I do feel seen by it and it definitely made me happy. And I don't think it's necessary to go extremely deep into Sam and Tara's family tree, but there's nothing particularly revolutionary about Latina people playing what essentially are white characters. I mean, how the casting director of The Wedding Planner, yes, the rom-com from the early 2000s, really thought that J-Lo could pass for an Italian woman. In what world? You don't entiendo eso. It's anti-Italian discrimination. It is a great start though, but there is a lot more work to be done. I personally would love to see a slasher film with a predominantly Latina cast where we could really get into the culture and see more about it. Mm, you know, maybe I should write that idea down myself. But all in all, I'm so excited to see two Latina final girls and I very much appreciate the depth that the writers have given them. And they play the characters so well well. I mean, Melissa Barrera and Jenna Ortega instantly make me feel seen when they're on screen. We definitely need more Latina final girls. We just need a lot more of it. And I'm really hoping that for the next Scream, maybe we'll delve a little bit more into it. Maybe we'll find out a little bit more about them. You know, I personally feel like I would have given Scream 6 five levs out of five if I would have gotten either Melissa Barrera or Jenna Ortega at least once calling Ghostface a pendejo in the bodega scene. And with all of that being said, let's get right back to Kylie. I love that girl. <laughs> Thank you so much also for a more in-depth analysis on it. I think it was really interesting that she touched on the more stereotypical representations we typically see. I too will be wishing and praying for them to call Ghostface Pendejo in the next one. But Jenna Ortega herself also briefly touched on the representation in this behind the scenes clip. What they're doing with this story is, I mean, well, it's kind of insane. I mean, they people of color as the leads, people of color who are surviving, an openly queer woman of color surviving and becoming the staple in the franchise so so important not only for people watching but then also just for accuracy of the time and um, making the film a bit more relatable. I'll also be having Kira and Mika on my channel later this month and we'll be sure to talk about Scream and the black representation as well. But huge shout out to Tiago and Solis their info is linked down below and you'll be seeing them on my channel very soon. It just makes me happy that all around everyone in the Scream world seems to be really happy right now. Of course there are a lot of people that didn't like Scream 6 but what's new? One of my favorite things about these movies too is how wholesome the experience of making making the film seems to be. Yet again, all these actors said it felt like summer camp. I love all these people and they take it way farther than that. We would hang out either in the courtyard of the hotel or in our rooms. For whatever reason, we were really about celebrating nothing in particular. I would do all my movies with this crew if I could. Oh, yeah. a dream. I love this group of people more than I can possibly put into words. It's funny I said in my contract, if Jasmine's there, I'm there. And that's the only stipulation I've had. And I'll probably move forward with every movie I ever do with that <laughs> in the contract. I would kill a man for a new nightmare type movie with all the people involved in the Scream franchise, by the way. They all want to keep working with each other, so why not? We can get Jennifer Jolie back, Jamie Kennedy, Matthew Lillard for all you Stu is still alive freaks. Someday, maybe. One returning actress that we haven't heard from yet is a one Courtney Cox who still has nothing but positive things to say about this franchise. Kevin Williamson and of course Wes Craven brought to this franchise what they did was they created a horror film that besides the, you know, the meta and going and and telling us what we shouldn't do in a horror film and then we do it. Everything was played realistically. You actually are invested in the characters. You're not laughing at them. You really don't want them to go because they're so engaging. And I think what Wes created is incredible. And then the guys, they just ran with it and made it up to date, more frightening. Everything that Wes would have done, would wanted to have done, and they the guys did it. Even though the directors have explicitly stated in interviews that they wanted to get away from the constant homages and really make Scream 6 their own, our legacy queen says they still kept a very West-like energy on set and that he would have been 
proud. Now, would I agree with that? I guess it's time to get into my spoiler-free thoughts. I've been blueballing you, I know, so now I have to tell you, did I like the film or didn't I? Did I love it? Did I hate it? Will I tell you? Will I keep fucking with you? Okay, here's the truth. I... Loved it, but it has so many problems. Like, oh my God, it has so many issues, but I loved it, but it's complicated. A lot of what's complicated, I can't say without getting into spoilers. So here is what I can say. I love Sam and Tara so much now. That was one of my biggest issues with Scream 5 is that they were so uninteresting and one note and fascinatingly, Jenna and Melissa agree with me. You get to spend so much time with them in this next movie and you get to see more colors to their relationship because in the fifth one, it's pretty much like the younger sister's getting attacked and yeah. the older sister is trying to protect her, and like that's it. Oftentimes in horror films, I am just screaming and crying. I feel like I'm often either really annoying or I play the stupid character, and Tara this time around had a personality, which was interesting. Dude, Jenna even said it. Tara has a personality this time around. She agrees. The directors mention that the foundation of the script never really changed once Nev pulled out, but that the focus had to be more so on the new characters. Huge blessing in disguise because I think it really worked out for the best. I've never been one of the people that's obsessed set about Nev not returning. I think they passed the torch really well in part five. And now with the focus on the core four, there is so much more room to fall in love with them. Something I didn't know is that Melissa has three younger sisters in real life, so she could draw on her real life to relate to Sam. We also talked in my last video about how she and Jenna had this immediate chemistry when they were reading for their characters. I guess on the set of Scream 6, they even were able to fool someone into thinking that they were sisters in real life. Do you remember in the last movie where an extra asked us if we were actually sisters and we both went, yeah. yeah, and she was like, oh my god, that's incredible. We were like, yeah. So talk about chemistry, am I right? It's wonderful in this movie. They're both such raw talents and they really did develop here. The same can't quite be said for Chad and Mindy, though they are more supporting characters than leads. I think that we did get to see more real emotion from them though, so there is a little bit of development. Whereas in Scream 5, I do feel like both of them were more so used for comedic relief. Everything about the intensity of the film was also upped for Scream 6, and speaking of Mason, he can speak to that. There's something uniquely brutal about Scream 6's ghost face because every time I felt myself like run a little faster. <laughs> and speaking of ghost face, oh mama, one of the best ghost face performances ever. I'm not talking about the reveal. I'm talking about the stuntman Max Leferrier. It's French, so I don't, I think that's how it's pronounced. You know I hate when they drop lines like, oh, this one just feels different, you guys. This is a ghost face unlike anyone we've ever seen before because it never is, but this this time the stunt work was truly like nothing I'd ever seen before from this franchise. James from Dead Meat said it best, it is the least clumsy ghost face ever. If you remember Scream for Dummies part two, there's a moment where ghost face just tumbles over a chair and it makes me crack up. Also the director has heard us when we complained that there were no chase scenes in Scream 5 because this movie has some intense sequences. The location of New York I think was used to the best it possibly could be. They also made sure to stress that New York was not sort of its own living, breathing character. They really just wanted to focus on people people just living their lives in New York, and I think it was done really effectively. They brought the gore, the action, the chill-inducing moments. However, with the extreme violence came a curious lack of stakes, which I did have a big problem with. Since doing my research, I've made a bit more peace with it because I kind of understand the filmmaker's perspective a bit better, but we'll talk about all of that in the spoiler section. My other huge negative is unfortunately Dermot Mulroney. This fucking guy. Honestly, you might want to click off of this video now because I'm not getting into any spoilers but this is something that I feel like you won't be able to unsee. And I'm gonna get into spoilers right after I talk about this anyways, so you might as well skedaddle. I'll be waiting right here for you once you go see the movie. So Dermot Mulroney, I really like him as an actor. I think his best performance is in New Girl. I don't know what on God's green earth he is doing in this movie. He is on a whole other planet than the other actors in this movie. I don't know what movie he thinks he's in, but it's not this one. The best way that I can describe it is maybe cartoon. -ish. It throws me off so badly. It's not quite as bad towards the beginning of the film, but in so many scenes that he's in, I get taken out because I'm like, why were these choices made? I got some insight to this as well, actually, from Jasmine and Mason. Dermot. Dermot, Dermot will. Dermot. I'll try. But you do it in a way where I'm like still Dermot's in Dermot's not it. doing it on purpose. Dermot will catch you out. You'll be like, Dermot whoa! Dermot thinks, <laughs> thinks he's acting. <laughs> That's a choice! Dermot? 
we could make a separate movie out of Dermot's gag reel. And knowing him and his talented self, we'd probably turn a pretty make nice millions. profit. And look, just because someone is a goofball does not mean they'll be an awkward fit in the film by any means. Just in this case, it happened to work out that way. I'm just incredibly unsurprised to hear that he would probably have the longest blooper reel, that he would make other people break character because of the weird choices he made, or that they would go on to describe him as a walking meme. That all adds up when you take into account how absolutely corny his performance is. I hate to say this about an actor that I really like. I think that he's really great in the projects that are right for him. I just don't think this one was. And the same thing can be said about Josh Segarra. He also brought a really weird vibe. Not quite as badly, but I was on a similar level where I was kind of being taken out of the film because I'm like, why are the vibes so off right now? I'll get into more of that later with specifics. Now I have a lot more positives and negatives I want to get into, but I do kind of have to save them for the spoiler section. So let me wrap up this section by saying, of course I recommend going to see Scream 6. I saw it twice in theaters and I loved it more the second time around, which is the opposite of what happened to me with Scream 5. I think they fixed a lot of the problems with Scream 5, but then a whole bunch of new problems I didn't even consider popped up in this one. And some problems I very much considered still linger from Scream 5. But overall it was a good time and I think that they have yet to make a bad Scream film. So let's finally get into some spoilers about Scream 6. I think that before Scream 7 comes out, I'll definitely do a Scream for Dummies part 6 where I do a really intense plot breakdown of this movie. Today is going to be more of a casual chat. Obviously, I don't really have any clips from the film to show you guys. And then I will have a spoiler stream about this movie in a few days, and we can talk about anything that you think I missed. So let's start with the opening, why don't we? I'll be honest, not one of my favorite Scream openings, despite my unrequited love of Samara Weaving. I love the dorky character she plays because been there. I've tried the dating app thing. It's weird. Of course, the last guy that asked me out in person chased me down in a parking lot because he was too nervous to talk to me inside of the actual grocery store. True story, and I wish I could tell you I was smart enough to turn him down, but I didn't. And actually, he's a nice guy. Anyways, this opening pissed me off for a few reasons. I am infuriated for the very reason that Ghostface himself points out. I can't believe you teach these movies and you went down a dark alley all by yourself. Sorry, but this is why you need a woman to get involved with the script. Uh, you need a woman screenwriter or you need a woman producing. I don't care. It's a real sausage party concerning who makes these movies behind the scenes. A woman in her 30s who just moved to New York, a pretty dangerous city, would never do that. I'm just like, you know, of course men wrote this. They don't exist in the same psychological landscape that we as women do. We have to be on guard all the fucking time. And you're gonna be like, oh, well, you went out with the guy that chased you down in the parking lot. Yeah, well, I didn't say I was very smart, did I? I'll tell you what, with that guy that I was just talking about, I texted my roommate. I texted him my location. I was like, this is where I'm gonna be. This is when I'd like to be home. I also sent my location to my best friend. I was like, you guys both keep tabs on me. And I have good intuition. He turned out to be really cool. But I just can't, I, that took me out of the movie within the first five minutes. That's not good. So it was just kind of a lackluster death. And then I also did get my hopes up when Ghostface unmasked himself. I thought that was a great swing to take. It freshened up the moment a lot as an opening that's never happened before. And it got me excited to think that potentially I'd be watching this Scream movie from an entirely new perspective. But as soon as he's on the phone with his partner and they're talking about their motive, I'm like, okay, so they're not actually going in a new direction. They're just making an extended opening. That's fine. I did like the scene of him on the phone. I think it was cool to kind of get the perspective of the killer. It was pretty weird. Oh, and the shots of him where he's just killed someone and he's just out walking among other pedestrians. Crazy when a movie reminds you that you've probably walked past a murderer at some point in your life. Also love the nod to Jason Takes Manhattan. It's playing on his TV in his apartment. Fun fact, they knew they wanted to reference that movie. They just had no idea where it was going to fit in. Originally, another movie was playing on that TV, but they couldn't get the rights to it. And so Paramount sent a list over to them of all the movies they did have rights to. And they were super late into the editing process, but lo and behold, Jason Takes Manhattan was on that list. Also later in the movie, the therapist is watching the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is my favorite horror movie from the 1950s. Well, it's tied with House of Wax, but still. Anyway, Roger L. Jackson is amazing as ever in this movie as he always is. And I love his line delivery of who gives a fuck about movies. I don't know how I feel about the line itself because I, I don't know if it makes sense. Because knowing that Bailey was the killer, I was like, 
you care about movies. You fed into every one of Richie's whims about the Stab franchise. So don't you, by proxy, give a fuck about movies? Anyway, that line ripped through me and someone tweeted about it with this clip from Dance Moms. It made me bust up laughing because that's exactly how I felt. Then we link up with Sam in therapy and I love this because right off the bat when we pick up with her, we learn so much more about her. There's one interview where Melissa was talking about how Sam is doing her due diligence to combat the trauma of what happened to her in the last movie. And I feel like this is really reminiscent of Sydney in one way in particular. I pointed out a few times the very subtle ways that Sydney proves she is a damn good role model for us women. Not just the moments where she's fighting the bad guys, but when she's setting boundaries for herself, when she's refusing to be a sellout. This is the first real moment where I feel like we got that from Sam. Hey, go to therapy. It's great. Even if you feel like you don't have any problems that necessitate therapy, just go. Everyone needs therapy, I promise. We never get to see our final girls getting that kind of help. And yes, it was also really expository, but I liked that because it caught us up on where Sam and Tara are at now. You can learn a lot about a character based on how they cope with things, how they fight with their loved ones, how they fall in love. We got to see all of that and more in this installment, which I was obsessed with. I love the overbearing sister angle that they took, even though it resolved in the corniest way possible in the climax. But I also busted out laughing when she was like, yeah, when I stabbed him, it felt right. And the therapist is just like, I am not equipped to handle this. This was also a new edge to Sam's character that I appreciated. I love her darkness. Sam is a tough girl. And I think I wanted that to continue, but I definitely wanted to show a more vulnerable side of her in this one. And she's also, I would say, not the typical final girl. I enjoy that darkness and I enjoy getting to play such a complex character that divides people. I think we really did see almost all sides of Sam in this movie. They really humanized her while somehow also still building up this darker side of her. To me, that made her an even more fascinating final girl than Sydney, who is the epitome of a moral compass. I love Sam now. Now, and in contrast to Scream 5, I find her to be the most fascinating character of this movie. All we knew before was protective sister, mentally ill. Now we see this vulnerable side of her, like she mentioned, of her falling for this dude, but being really careful and guarded about it. We see her dealing with a lot of the world hating her, and it's a really weird meta moment because, yeah, she did deal with a lot of hate for replacing Sydney. So much to get into with her character, I should really pace myself. The next scene that I loved was the convenience store scene. I praise Scream 4 to the high heavens for bringing the horror back to public spaces, and this movie did it maybe the best out of the entire franchise. Yeah, I said it even better than Scream 2. The fact that you breathe this sigh of relief when they get into the store and the strangers stick up for them. This guy is like, yeah, you got a problem? You're like, thank God, these people will be on their side. Cool. And Ghostface just lays them out. Max has a new fan in me. His Ghostface is truly impeccable. Max is a force, man. He's an actor turned stuntman. There's a, a like a real performance in, in the way that he approached things. And yeah. Would you give Max different different directions based on who you I was going to ask that same thing mask? like physically mm -hmm. or was it just like just be ghostface yeah just be ghostface and bravo because we'll talk about this more I really enjoyed the heightened reality of this new ghostface magic the people that end up being ghostface never really have the same kind of physicality but I don't care I just like seeing them fuck people up some people might be like oh it takes me out I don't know it's just it's not realistic Quinn would never be able to have that kind of physicality blah 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 it's just a movie. It's pretend. If you're an adult, you should know that. Let's all listen to Britney Spears. Now we have to talk about maybe one of the most obvious ghost face killers there ever was. The first scene with Detective Bailey and Sam and Tara is all fine and normal until he's like, well, I'm Quinn's father, so I can definitely vouch for her. I was like, what are you hiding, sir? And of course he's a cop. He could plant evidence. He could do a whole mess of crap. They leave way too many clues about him being the killer. And in fact, I called two of the three killers, unfortunately. Anyway, I did find it really interesting that at all all the attacks, the ghost face would leave different masks from previous killings. That was a cool way to up the stakes and connect everything to the past. And speaking of the past, Kirby's back. Kirby's back and Kirby's back and Kirby's back. I shake my ass. I enjoy the character development from Kirby. I really do. She makes a lot of sense as an FBI agent and I think it makes the police involvement so much more relevant. Police have always been involved in Scream, mostly because of Dewey, but we also had the iconic Adam Brody. We had Patrick Dempsey. What a cool natural franchise 
franchise arc that now a survivor is part of the FBI. What's not a cool natural franchise arc is what happens with Gale, which is up next. When Sam and Tara leave the station, we meet Scream 1 Gale all over again. This is one of my biggest problems with the movie, the arc retcon of a one Gale Weathers. First movie, Dewey is being loaded up into the audience, like, where's Gale? And she's busy doing her reporting. In Scream 2, she starts to develop empathy. She goes to Dewey's side immediately and goes with him in the ambulance. In Scream 3, they get engaged. In Scream 4, they're going through a marital rough patch, so she regresses a little bit, but ultimately by the end, they come back together. In Scream 5, she loses her best friend, that is Dewey, and she comes to the most natural end of her arc possible. She refuses to write a book about Richie and Amber. It was the perfect conclusion to her arc, and you just walked back on that, and now we gotta start from goddamn scratch. Pissed me off as someone who's very invested in Gail, and I'm always someone that's defended her, so you've just made my job a lot harder. I think she loves fame. She loves to be recognized and thought of, and um, as she says, somebody was gonna do it, and why not? Why wouldn't she get the credit? See, now I really feel like I'm on an island because even Courtney Cox doesn't seem to care that her arc was retconned. Here's how I'm gonna rationalize it because she does have nicer moments later on in the movie. Gail lost her best friend and it seems like during moments of hardship in her life, she regresses. As we all do because no one's arc is gonna be perfect. But this one just really stings because we did a lot of work to get to where we were in Scream 5. And I would have said exactly what Sam said. What would Dewey think? I would just like to think that I guess now Gail is in a place in her life where she truly has nothing left to lose. So she might as well write a book. I'm gonna go with that because later on in the movie, oh my God, when she's talking about Dewey and his score starts playing, I start crying. She's like, my parents suck too, but you can make a new family even if it's only with one person. And it's like, do, 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 do. And I, oh my God, I'm gonna start crying just thinking about it right now. Why does this franchise make me cry so much? No, we're not doing it. <laughs> Suck him back in. Suck him back in. What did you think of her weird character arc regression? The next thing I want to touch on is the latter scene, which I thought was kind of unique and cool. But I don't know if it was just me, but when she first looks down at the ground, it does not look that high up to me. It's supposed to be a very high stakes situation, but the ground looks so close. Is, was that just me? Also, Annika's death made me cry the second time that I watched the movie. I love Mindy, you know that. And so her reaction to the death just sent me. I would love if in Scream 7, we got a little bit more development of Mindy and how now maybe she refuses to date people because she's too paranoid about her love interest killing her or being killed. But this attack leads to the two most obvious clues about who the killers are. Bailey is crying over the death of his daughter and he's like, you mess with my family, you die. I swear he said it just like that. He's so intense. I feel like when you are the actor that is Ghostface, you really need to pick your moments. He way oversold this one. Tyler Gillette was talking about how this is supposed to be a red herring moment that's too obvious so you think that it's definitely not him. I was like, no, he's pretty much just outing himself there. Why would I not trust that that's what's happening? That's what they did with Billy. To be fair, I did think that Quinn really died. I thought that maybe he was just crazy enough to kill his own kid or that whoever was his killing partner took it upon themselves to kill her and that we would get some ghost face on ghost face action because that's how the movie opened. So I thought, oh, maybe it'll be kind of like a ghost face competition of sorts. They should do that. They were going to in the original Scream 5 plans with Jill, remember? My email is right down below. If Guy, James, you're interested, I am more than willing to bounce some ideas off of you. Then we get to see the shrine of all the ghost face killers. And I think it's kind of ironic that the filmmakers were like, yeah, we were really excited to get away from the homages and make this our own. Yeah, a shrine filled with artifacts from the entire franchise just screams originality, you know? But yet again, I'm like, stop making the killer so obvious because Gail is going on about how, oh, police officers can be bought, present company excluded, talking about Kirby and Bailey. And I'm like, okay, well, obviously there's not going to be some random cop character introduced in the third act of the movie. And between Bailey and Kirby, obviously my money is going to be on Bailey as a killer. And this whole time Mindy is on Ethan's case about him being her number one suspect. So I was like, okay, he's for sure the other killer. Because Randy called the killer in Scream 1 and Scream 2 and Mindy is going on about how she didn't call it in Scream 5. So her constantly calling Ethan the other ghost face, I was like, they're trying to spin me off the trail and it's just not working. I I know better and I trust my horror nerd characters. And more on that later, by the way. So then later on, I was a little bit thrown off by the park scene because Ethan and Bailey are both there when Ghostface is calling them. But I was thinking, oh, they pre-recorded the Ghostface dialogue. They haven't done that before because the conversation with Sam was so brief and there wasn't very much back and forth. I was like, oh, this is some trickery. But regardless, the next scene with Gail fucking rips. I can't believe this is the first time that Gail has spoken with Ghostface. It was wonderful. I love the comment 
commentary about her never being the leading lady and how she is the sex appeal. Because, oh, I didn't even mention it because it was so underwhelming, but the commentary of this movie is so lame. They chose to go with franchise commentary and they laid down all these rules that they didn't even follow. That was another massive issue that I took with this movie because they even laid out, yeah, Luke Skywalker had to die so his franchise could go on. The legacy characters are cannon fodder at this point, leading me to believe that I could expect some real stakes. But no, even Gail, who gets stabbed to shit and a giant piece of glass cuts a bunch of her organs in half, she lives? I started crying when Sam and Tara showed up because I was like, oh my god, they're really doing it. We're saying goodbye to Gail. And then of course, as soon as she's like, I feel a weak pulse, I'm like, okay, pff, are you kidding me? And it turns out her death, it was never gonna happen. Was Gail ever right, in danger yeah. of, of dying this time? Was there ever a permutation that Gail wasn't gonna make it? No, we still feel bad about Dewey while we think <laughs> it was right for that movie and we would do it again. As fans before we were involved in Scream, it hurts. That to us would just be too cruel. It'd be too, it'd be too much. It would, it would take away too much of the fun of Scream. We wanted to make sure Gail made it through. Their reasoning is because the original is such an evergreen classic because the characters you love make it out alive. Well, you're on the sixth installment. I think it's okay if Gail doesn't survive a sixth time. That's just like why I'm okay with saying goodbye to Dewey. Scream 6 is never going to be the evergreen classic that the original movie is, so you might as well take that swing. Especially with how badly she and other people are injured. I guess that getting stabbed in the stomach is the equivalent of getting a paper cut these days because people are just walking around after it happens to them. This was a massive issue that I took with the movie at first, but the insight that I found in interviews helps me to appreciate it a little bit more. Because multiple interviewers asked the directors about the logic of keeping these characters alive after everything that happens to them. You can make logical choices and you can make choices that feel, that feel great. And sometimes those things intersect and are perfectly aligned and sometimes they aren't. And I think for us, we don't want the logic to be at the expense of how it feels. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's more yeah. important to us that you leave the movie feeling a certain way than the movie like is scientifically accurate. Mm -hmm. Like that's just not why we show up to, <laughs> to be entertained in a movie theater. One of the things that we talked about a lot during this process was that this should be a secret feel good movie. And we knew we didn't want to kill these characters. Like it really might be us just being softies and being like, I don't know, we just love them. We love them as actors. We love the characters. Like, you know, there are obviously conversations about, well, should so-and-so die, should so-and-so die. And no. We understand and are, are fully, fully embrace that we play a little fast and loose with that. I think that that's part of the fun of these movies and the heightened reality that they that they live in. Movies have desensitized audiences in that sense, right? Like we see so many movies now where there's just an insane amount of action and there's a crazy outcome to those to those sequences. And I think that we creatively were comfortable with that. We were like, cool, let's exist in the lineage of these movies that are like far into a franchise where batshit crazy things happen. And then it feels really good when those characters, when those yeah. characters make it out alive. So I've decided to resign myself to this. Yes, I do think they're too big of softies. Yes, I would like the stakes to feel like they exist at all. But my new perspective is just to enjoy the heightened reality of it because that's why I love movies like Kingsman. Those movies are ludicrous, but the high intensity action is why I love them. Another thing I learned is that while shooting, they are constantly pushing the violence. They liked to film way more than they needed in terms of how many times people were getting stabbed. So that way they'd have options and usually dial things back in the edit. All of that is kind of adding up to me now and I can kind of accept it. But not with Gail and not with a few other characters, honestly. Because yet again in the next scene, Mindy gets stabbed so brutally, I'm assuming in several organs, and we're expected to believe she'd just be up running around hours later. But this next scene is still one of the best of the movie. I was hoping for a subway scene and oh boy did we get one. Talk about terror in public spaces. And all the costumes of the other horror icons, I was giddy about that attention to detail. They even had Georgie from It with a red balloon, c'est magnifique. Not much to get into there, it's a lot of people just kind of staring at other people on the subway. So let's get into this finale, shall we? Much to discuss. Oh, Scream 2 called, It Wants Its Plot Back. But before we get into that, they really tried to make me believe that Kirby had gone crazy. Really? Didn't buy it for a second, not a single goddamn second, you know why? These writers don't have the balls. They proved that to me with the opening. They proved that to me by refusing to kill off Gail, even though her stomach had been turned into deli meat. So I was like, mm-hmm, yes. Uh, just as I thought, Detective Bailey is obviously one of the killers. But on the flip side, when Chad got attacked, I started crying because I was like, oh, he's for sure dead. I was like, there's no way that after they let Gail and Mindy survive, they'd let him live too, especially not with his lifeblood 
pouring from his mouth. And I wasn't expecting them to copy the ending of Scream 2 where they wheel him out just like Dewey because so much of the reveal was already Scream 2 vibes. So I guess they got me there. Especially because of the romance they set up between him and Tara. I was like, oh my God, they're actually making me feel something here. Like an honest to God, kill your darlings moment. I was like, damn, that was clever, but no. I have lots of fun facts about the reveal though. So Bailey comes in and he's like, of course me. And I was like, yeah, of course you. Then Ethan and Quinn are revealed. Quinn got me. I didn't see that coming. Also didn't expect them to be Richie's family, but I was like, Ugh, okay, Mrs. Loomis vibes. The actors that played Ethan and Quinn didn't find out they were going to be Ghostface until their wardrobe fitting. They tried on all their regular costume clothes. And then at the very end, they were presented with their Ghostface robes. They also had every single actor that auditioned read off Amber's Ghostface monologue to decide who their killer would be. They said that Josh Segura had an excellent read as Ghostface, but you can't make the love interest the killer again. I think he would have made a good killer because like I said, his vibe the entire movie was off. I hated his weird whisper dialogue because especially at the end when you learn that he is not a killer, it's like, ugh, he's kind of a weirdo. Don't trust anyone, not your friends, not me anyone. Him and Dermot. I'm like, you guys need to try to get on the same page as everyone else because you're being weird. Sometimes I guess that's a problem with the Scream movies because it's just like Liv in Scream 5 where it's too obvious of a red herring. And I'm like, why is a non-killer acting like such a fucking freak right now? Some people were like, oh, well, Liv had beef with Mindy. And I'm like, if that works for you, sure. Pretty high stakes situation to decide to act that strangely. Speaking of weird, Dermot's performance in that whole climax scene is so bizarre bizarre. I don't have the words for it. Like I said, cartoonish. It's like he's seen all the critiques of Scream and how it's really similar to Scooby-Doo and just ran with that. It just didn't feel as authentic as, say, someone like Timothy Oliphant. That is a truly unhinged performance. I didn't get any kind of cartoon vibes from him. And even Matthew Lillard as Stu, who is one of the most cartoonish actors of this entire franchise, still read as very authentically psychotic. But anyway, I also found the blocking of that scene to be so weird too. They like jump over one of the displays and then the killers kind of circle them, but it's all really slow and clunky. Killer monologue was oh, like oh, that. I was yeah, like, yeah, monologue yeah, yeah. Was easy. The killer monologue, there was, I mean, I, how many, yeah, how no, many that was weekends, it. Yeah. weekends were consumed with just blocking, blocking, talking about how to block that scene and like hats off to all of them because they gave us so much to work with in the edit that even after going through it all there, then we got to the edit and I remember Jay, our editor, was like, how do we want to do this scene? You know, there's like a million versions of that scene that we could have ended up with. Girl, we can tell. I'm sorry, but I just found the killer reveal to be so awkward, even though I love the rest of the scene. But it's just their whole monologue and their motive that I'm like getting secondhand embarrassment. Also in that interview, they talked about how the third act had the most changes from script to screen and a lot of it changed right before they shot it. They don't get into it, but I guess the reveal used to be a lot more convoluted before they decided to go with good old fashioned revenge. But again, Mrs. Loomis called and would like her motive back. Hello. Hello, I'm editing. How are you doing? So one thing that I can't believe that I forgot to mention also about the killer reveal is that I almost wouldn't care who the killers were, even if it did surprise me. Because this is an issue that I think still lingers from Scream 5. I don't give a about the side characters. They're all so bland. Like, I like Annika. There's nothing wrong with them, per se. But, like, Ethan, for example, such a nothing character. Like, why would I care? Okay, he's Ghostface, so what? The whole time in the movie, whenever he's on screen, he's just kind of there. Detective Bailey is a little bit more impactful, but it's like I've been saying this whole time, he was way too obvious. Quinn was the only real surprise. So that is probably the number one thing that I would like to see improved upon in Scream 7. Because if you look at the casts of movies like Scream, Scream 2 and Scream 4, all those side characters are memorable down to the characters that only have like two scenes. So I beg, let's let's fix that issue in the next one. Okay, bye. Aside from that, I love the climax. I think the Carpenter sisters are so badass. Like I said, I don't like how corny their relationship arc conclusion is where she's like, you have to let me go. Do you get it? It's a metaphor. But oh, when they're swinging bricks and they're stabbing gross virgins in the mouth, weird that they tried to get us to buy into the fact that Jack Champion is like this weird, nerdy, dork virgin. He's a very handsome kid. I don't think he would have had that much trouble chasing tail at that school, but whatever. We do get that line from him that's, oh, I've always wanted to stick something in you, Tara. You need to leave. 
Seriously, so foul. Also, yet again, we have our beloved heroes defying physics by falling from a second story balcony onto a knife and surviving. Can you even fathom how far that knife would have gone into Tara's stomach and she's just walking around afterwards? But Sam has this moment. She gets this look in her eye before she charges Bailey. They go tumbling over the railing. I told you, I'm in love with Sam now. Even more so after she absolutely wails on Bailey and kills him so dead. It's such a fun twist on a final girl because yes, Sydney is the perfect moral compass, but that means she's only relatable to a point. Humans are flawed. We all have a darkness in us and it's healthy to express it sometimes. We do that through our love of horror movies. Sam and I both do it through going to therapy, but Sam and Tara also do it by stabbing the bad guys. They keep toying with us though, especially at the end where she's holding Billy's mask, but then she just like drops it and walks away. I think that that darkness is something that that character will always have yeah. in her. I yeah. think it's the thing that we love about Sam. And it's not about overcoming it and exactly. getting rid of it. It's about accepting it. That's the yeah, thing dealing with it. I love their explanation there, but I do want them to push it a bit farther. My Scream 7 predictions will probably come out whenever that movie is announced, but I can already tell you one of them will be me predicting that Sam is going to be one of the killers. I also need to react to my Scream 6 predictions soon. That'll be next week's video. To wrap things up today, though, I am glad that all the core four survived. I don't know how Kirby survived or Mindy or Gail or Tara, but hey. It's just a movie. It's pretend. You're an adult. You should know that. Few things that I wish were expanded upon. Oh, the nerd out scene between Mindy and Kirby. That was only like 20 seconds of them talking about horror movies together. We deserved so much more. It should have been a running gag throughout the movie whenever they were in a scene together. That was also the scene where they just briefly dropped that line that was like, yeah, if you believe that Stu is really dead, wouldn't they know? Wouldn't these characters from Woodsboro, one of them in the FBI, wouldn't they know? Let's listen to some interview insights about that. Oh. Oh, you don't like that he's no, alive? No, I don't like Neither that. Do, you, honestly, I might agree. They think that Stu's still alive. Who does? People. The, the inner, the inner. Oh, oh, oh. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so either. I no, say I Stu is alive so I could meet <gasps> Matthew Lillard. Hi, Matthew. I love you. Stu Mocker is dead, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Stu, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on who you ask. I would say that the debate remains alive. We brought Billy Billy Loomis back as a hallucination. So I, I feel like anything's, yeah. anything's fucking possible. You're, you're... So make of that what you will. I say he's dead. One of their writers, Guy Busick, apparently keeps trying to push for his comeback and everyone else is just like, no. That's why why I say we flip a new nightmare on this bitch. But after Scream 7, after the Core 4's trilogy, if that's what it ends up being. That's all I have for today though, guys. I told you it wasn't gonna be a super intensive plot breakdown, so just comment down below whatever I missed and we can chat about it. But I'll also have a live in another few days and we can touch on everything I missed there. You probably also noticed these names scrolling on screen. These are my lovely patrons. If you'd like to get four to six bonus videos every single month over there and be credited as a producer of this channel, the link is down below, come join us come join us. It's a hoot. Those bonus videos should start to come more frequently pretty soon here, especially as we really get into the real movie season. Been a bit of a dry start to the year, but I have done bonus videos on Scream 6. They got to know my opinions very early on. I did one for 65. My dad and I will do one for Ant-Man and the Wasp. We did a whole Oscars podcast over there. But yeah, if that's not for you, all the rest of my social media is also linked down below. I'm very excited for all the rest of the Scream content that is still to come this month. I hope that you are too, and that I catch you in the next one. Bye!